Bias is one of those topics in psychology that tends to be misunderstood by a lot of people. Typically, when somebody hears the word bias, what comes to their mind is something like racial discrimination or stereotyping. While those are examples of bias, bias is a much larger topic. It can be defined as a partiality or inclination or predisposition for or against something. While some biases can be instinctual, like our tendency to see human shapes and inanimate objects, you know, like how many people can see the man in the moon, the vast majority of biases are developed based upon our experience and information that's made available to us throughout our lives. This is one of the reasons why it's unfair to confuse bias as being the same thing as discrimination. Because while not everybody exhibits discrimination, everyone engages in bias. In fact, it's a pretty universal human experience. While there are dozens of different types of bias that have been identified, in this video, I'm going to talk about eight of the most common types of bias. It's worth noting that bias and all of its different manifestations largely comes from the experiences and information that we're exposed to. It's an example of how the prototype model can influence our thinking. Because of that, if you haven't watched the video yet on the prototype model, I encourage you to watch it before finishing this video because it'll help explain how these biases can develop. I would also encourage you to watch my video on problem solving strategies and specifically the section that deals with heuristics because all biases stem from heuristics. The eight types of bias that I'm going to talk about today are loss aversion, base rate neglect, availability heuristic, anchoring bias, confirmation bias, hindsight bias, and finally, representative bias. As I go through each of these, I'll be sure to give a definition of the specific type of bias, but also to give at least one example of that bias so that it can help you better understand how the bias actually works. Keep in mind that while I'm going through many different types of bias in this video, it is by no means all the biases that exist, but rather the most common ones. Let's start with loss aversion. Loss aversion is the tendency to weigh potential losses more heavily than potential gains. You see this come up a lot with people who are afraid to engage in certain activities or behaviors because of fear of failure or some other kind of misfortune happening to them. But in the process of doing this, they miss out on the benefits of engaging in that behavior. When I think of loss aversion, it makes me think of a friend that I have. This friend has been single for a really long time, and my wife and I have encouraged her to do online dating. In fact, my wife and I both met online, uh, which is one of the reasons why we keep encouraging her to at least give it a shot. However, every time we do, our friend keeps talking about all the reasons why she thinks it won't work. The next bias I'm going to talk about is base rate neglect. Base rate neglect is a tendency to ignore information about general principles in favor of very specific but vivid information. So essentially what happens with base rate neglect is that you ignore a large amount of information and go off of very specific personal information. So let me explain that another way, going off the example I used for loss aversion. My wife and I have both talked to our friend about how good online dating can be. Our friend looked at information online that talked about how most people nowadays meet their spouses through online dating. And she's even looked at statistics that have supported this. However, if she met one person that told her a scary story about how she met somebody online and that person started to stalk her and it was a horrible, terrifying experience, that one story is going to stoke my friend's fears and will stand out more to her. This is a great example of base rate neglect. With base rate neglect, you're usually judging more personal and emotional information over logic, facts that may actually be less personal and less emotional. Next on our list of biases is availability heuristic. Now, if you remember, a heuristic is any kind of mental framework that is largely based on past experiences or knowledge. 
An availability heuristic is a bias that isn't based off personal past experiences or knowledge, but rather experiences or knowledge or information that is widely made available to the person and is now influencing their perspectives. A good definition of an availability heuristic is a prediction about the probability of an event based on the ease of recalling or imagining similar events. Some of the best examples of availability heuristics involve news coverage. So if a person has been watching news coverage of say a plane crash, based upon that information that's being made available to them, they may start now having a fear of flying. This is different from a regular heuristic because the person didn't directly experience it, rather it's the information being made available to them that's influencing their decision. There's actually been some studies that have shown that a person's political perspectives can be influenced based upon the type of news coverage that they watch. If a person watches more conservative news coverage, they tend to shift their political views to be more conservative. If a person watches more liberal news coverage, they tend to shift their political views to be more liberal. The next bias I'm going to talk about is anchoring bias. An anchoring bias is a faulty heuristic in which you fixate on a single aspect of a problem in order to find a solution. As a college professor, I see anchoring bias come up quite a bit with my students. For example, oftentimes when I assign a research paper for them to do, I'll have many students that immediately will just look at websites like Wikipedia and overly rely on them at the exclusion of any other source of information. I've even had students Google things that I've talked about in class and then tell me whether or not Google agrees with what I'm saying. This is an over-reliance on just one source of information and is great examples of anchoring bias in action. However, we'll also deal with anchoring bias in terms of our thinking. Sometimes you see where anchoring bias comes up where a person may overly focus on how a solution was solved in the past and then overly rely on that solution in the future. For this reason, I call anchoring bias the if it ain't broke, don't fix it bias because it can be demonstrated in a person relying on the way something may have been done in the past without thinking about new or innovative ways to improve it. Because of this, anchoring bias can also further solidify the mental rigidity that can further a lot of these other biases. The next bias I'm gonna talk about is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a faulty heuristic in which you focus on information that confirms your beliefs. So basically with confirmation bias, you're making an assumption and then looking for information that supports your assumption. I see this come up quite a bit with students when I assign them research papers to do. They first come up with what their opinion is of the research topic and then they just look for studies that tend to support their beliefs. However, this isn't the point of a research paper. The point of a research paper is to look at the available research and then from that develop your conclusion. The truth is we engage in confirmation bias on a pretty constant basis, and it's likely the most common type of bias that we experience. In fact, a lot of people have said algorithms for social media sites and internet search engines largely operate off of confirmation bias. Think about it. The more you search for something, the more that site is going to remember what you're searching for and present search results that fit with your past searches. The problem is a lot of people don't understand or realize how this can limit their understanding of topics because it limits their access to new information that may challenge their assumptions. In my opinion, this is one of the reasons why confirmation bias can also be one of the most dangerous forms of bias. Hindsight bias is the belief that the event that a person has just experienced was predictable, even though it really wasn't. I call hindsight bias the Monday morning quarterback bias, or the I knew it all along bias. Where confirmation bias influences a person's thinking in the moment, hindsight bias happens after the fact. It plays a big role in strengthening the other biases. In fact, I talk a lot about how confirmation bias and hindsight bias oftentimes go hand in hand in the video I did on research bias. 
If you haven't watched that video, definitely make sure you check it out, especially the second half where I talk about confirmation and hindsight bias. You can see the link for that video below. The final bias I'm going to talk about is representative bias. Representative bias is a faulty heuristic in which a person stereotypes someone or something without a valid basis for their judgment. It's called representative bias because usually it involves the person basing a general judgment on a very specific and small example from their personal life. Representative bias plays a big role in fostering issues with things like racial discrimination, stereotyping, and prejudice. The important thing to remember is that with representative bias, it usually involves where you have had a bad experience or encounter that has influenced how you feel towards a larger group of people or things in general. A great example of representative bias that I can think of comes from when I was a kid. Way back when I was a lot younger, my mom decided to take me to an Indian restaurant. Up to this point, I never tried Indian food before. It just wasn't something I was ever exposed to. The restaurant she decided to take me to had just opened up and it was actually kind of attached to like this hotel. I remember going to that restaurant and the food being really, really bad. In fact, it was probably one of the worst dining experiences I've ever had in my entire life. I remember my mom talking about how much she hated the food as well. And in fact, we didn't even finish our meal. We just got up and left. This stood out in my mind and for the rest of my childhood and even into early adulthood, I hated Indian food. I hated it not because the cuisine itself was bad or something that I just didn't like, but rather based upon a very small specific experience I had had with just one restaurant. Without really knowing it, I let this one specific experience change my perspective and how I viewed the entire cuisine. This continued up to about my mid-20s when I went on a date with an Indian woman. She wanted to take me to an Indian restaurant for dinner. Although I didn't really think I would enjoy it, I still agreed to go, and I'm happy I did because it was an amazing restaurant and the food was phenomenal. In fact, it changed my opinion of Indian food, and now Indian food is probably one of my favorite cuisines. It's funny because even though that relationship didn't last very long, my love of Indian food has. Now, I go to my favorite Indian restaurant probably at least two or three times a month. This is a great example of a representative bias. And although I'm talking about something benign like food, you can probably expand upon my story to how a person can view individuals based on their ethnicity, race, gender, sex, sexual orientation, based on the experiences that they've had, not with that person specifically, but based upon somebody who represents that group to them at some point in their lives. It's worth noting that as I went through all of the biases today in this video, that not every bias is necessarily one that we're aware of. We generally break up biases as being either explicit, so ones that we know about and that we're aware of, and implicit bias. These are biases that we're not really fully aware of or maybe even 100% in control of. Explicit bias is more obvious and because of that, it can be identified and changed more readily. Implicit bias can be difficult to identify, and oftentimes the person that exhibits it may not even recognize that they have that bias in the first place, which can make it a little bit more difficult to change. The one big takeaway that I hope all of you have from watching this video is to think a little bit more actively about how your perspectives, your views, your way of thinking has been shaped by your past and how it may influence how you think and especially how you treat other people today. Thanks for watching everybody.